Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Darshan Talks. Our guest is hidden. He's coming back into frame as we, as we speak. Uh, <laughs> I'm your host, Darshan Kulkarni. It's my mission to help you trust the products you depend on. Um, as you know, I'm an attorney, I'm a pharmacist, and I advise companies with FDA-regulated products. So if you think about drugs, wonder about devices, or obsess over pharmacy, this is the podcast for you. Um, I do have to specify that I am an attorney, but I'm not your attorney. I'm a pharmacist, but I'm not your pharmacist. So this is neither legal advice nor clinical advice. But I do these interviews because they're a lot of fun, and um, and, I, and I find myself learning something new every single time. And it, it's always wonderful to know if someone's listening. So if you like what you hear, please like, leave a comment, please subscribe. Uh, if you want, you can actually ask questions. Our guest today is amazing at riffing and, and answering questions, so that's going to be a lot of fun. And I'm excited to sort of have that conversation. If you like the video itself, uh, please share the video. And... Um, like I said, please jump in, ask questions. Um, if you want to find me, you can reach me on uh, Twitter at Darshan Talks or just go to our website at darshantalks.com. Uh, today's podcast, today's live stream is about, well, I'm trying to decide what it's about because there are so many different topics I want to get into. We just did a very, very quick, <laughs> we just did a very, very quick, what could this be about? And I have at least seven topics I, I want to jump into. Uh, truth is, we usually don't get past one. So this is not going to, this is going to be hard. But let's see what, what actually pops out. Um, but if you are interested in learning and development, if you are interested in executive coaching, if you are interested in inclusive um, inclusive leadership and, and professional development. Um, this is the conversation for you. Our guest today is the co-founder of Q Squared Limited, a learning and development company. He's a, he's a speaker, an executive coach, a facilitator, focusing on including leadership and cultural competence. Um, our guest for today, uh, David McQueen. Hey, David. Hey, Darshan. Good to be here. Good to be here. Thank it's you. It's good to have you. Yes, it's, 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 <laughs> you, you, you sound more relaxed. One might say you were resting on an island quite recently and came back, and you're just now calmer and more more in touch with your zen. Yes. Um, how how true is that? One might say that I was a, in a Caribbean island as opposed to a UK <laughs> island. Yes, indeed. That, that's <laughs> fair. <laughs> and it was a lot warmer. Yes, definitely. And yes, so much zen. It was a really good and relaxed. Even though it's busy back, having that space to recharge in the sunshine was amazing. So I'm I'm glad I had it. And um, it was the first holiday since the pandemic. So I'm glad to have had it um, and, and back safe and sound. It, it's funny you talk about how um, you, you just went to went to uh, Barbados, I believe, and, and came back and came, went to the Caribbean. The Caribbean, thank you. Um, and um, what, what I found was interesting was a friend of mine that the interview I did yesterday, uh, was with another individual who just went to Sicily and came back. What I'm he hearing from people is people are ready to leave their homes. People are ready to walk out and people are going, two years of being stuck inside, I'm done with that. I need to actually get out there a little bit more. Um, how much of that is what drove you and how much of it was, you know what, I, I need to sort of recharge and this is where I really need to go and I can't recharge at home anymore. W what sort of drove you? I think it was I think it was double. So last year was my wife and I, we had our 25th uh, wedding anniversary. Oh, and congratulations. The, thank you. And the intention was is that we, we've got two grown daughters, I'm 19 and 23. The intention was is that we were kind of going to do a mixture of going away with them and then going away for ourselves. But then obviously COVID came along and said, ha ha, none of that. Um, and so we ended up doing a result, uh, going to a, a small break in the, the UK but I said to my wife earlier in the year that when they are less strict on the lockdowns, and and as long as we're both double, we're both doubly vaccinated, um, and so as long as we were able to then go um, on uh, on a holiday, and it would be you know pretty, we wanted to make sure that the environment that we were going to go into was pretty safe and sound as well. Once we could do that, we would double down. And we would book tickets and we went. And we, when the opportunity came, we were just like, we've been working hard this year. We need to go away. Our daughter went back up to, our youngest daughter went back up to college or to university. And our youngest was working. We were like, okay, well, they're old enough. They're adults now. We are out of here. And we went. And it was one of the best things we ever done. So it was about recharging. But also, it was just nice to have that opportunity to travel. Even though there were some restrictions on it, you know, flying uh, eight hours on a plane with a mask is not the most comfortable thing in the world, apart, obviously, apart from when you're eating and drinking. But that was a sacrifice we were willing to make, and it was so worth it. 
Uh, sorry, I was trying to demonstrate where you could have been because I was I was looking at a picture of Barbados going, I hate you so much right now. Uh, <laughs> apparently, it's the, sa the, the Sandals Royal Barbados picture that came up with these. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll send out, put out a link. But I, I thought that was really interesting. And, and, and I hated you enough to, to sort of self-flagellate myself <laughs> as, I, as I look at that and going, I wish I could be there. But we were, um, we were at the Crane, if it helps, all right? The Crane Hotel. Go and, go and look at that one and then get <laughs> I'm so afraid to look at that. <laughs> I'm not sure that's going to help. <clears throat> I, I think if you can name the hotel, that's a bad sign. Because when I travel, I'm looking at what's the closest hostel or Airbnb I can stay at. <laughs> <laughs> so we may have had we may have slightly different travel experiences. Yes. Um, so so one of the things as part of the travel um, that that you've mentioned, it's, it's one of your goals, is um, this idea of creating a uh, streams of income for yourself where you're not restricted to a single location or to a um, si single sort of geographical limitation. Um, talk to me a little bit about how you're achieving or aiming to achieve that goal. Is it through uh, Q squared or is it through some of these other goals that you're, you're pursuing? And, and how are you balancing that against the need for people to say, I wanna meet you, I wanna shake your hand and that warm handshake is what closes the deal. Uh, so it, is a, it definitely is a balancing act, but I think over the last year, the one thing I realized, you know, last year in Q squared was our most profitable year ever. Um, part of that would have been, there was a really high demand around equity and inclusion and tough conversations but from leaders having to deal with the pandemic. Um, but what we were able to do, we were able to position ourselves so that we were in demand so we could talk to senior leadership teams and we could talk to senior management groups as well about where they wanted to go and how they were going to navigate this really difficult time. But what it meant and what it re what really hit home for us is that we were able to deliver that, reducing our travel time by at least two thirds. Because obviously you've got to make your way somewhere there, then you've got to go deliver and then you've got to make your way back. Whereas now I just came downstairs, went, st yes, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 That's what we're, that's Therein what lies my self-flagellation. That's what it looked like in the morning. I'm just letting you know. I thing. hate you. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, just knowing that there was a, an ability to be able to reach these audiences. And, and you know, look, there was, a, there, was a real, there was a real powerful, a couple of powerful moments where you realize that um, I could talk to individuals across different time zones in Latin America, in the Middle East, in Hong Kong, in London, without having to get on a plane. I did it from the comfort of my my office here my simple home office and was able to reach out to some incredible audiences um to be able to explain to them that you know this is these are some of the things that they needed in order to be able to take their the their business or their professional development to the next level and so it really made me think look if i could do that and and and, and not to rub your nose into the kind of um barbados thing again but last year last year what they did is they offered um internationals the opportunity to work in Barbados remotely for free for a year. So they really relaxed the, the rules. And as long as you were um, had done, gone through your various uh, testing to show that you didn't have COVID, et cetera, what have you, you could literally work from a villa or a space for a whole year. And I knew about six or seven people in my network who actually did that, picked themselves up from England, moved to Barbados and remotely have worked from there across different time zones. So having that experience now, not only do I want to be able to do it in Q squared and be able to continue to coach and provide that speaking from a distance, but I want to, my next level, and I was saying to you offline before, is the development of an investment company. I want to, I'm, I'm developing myself as an angel investor and I want to be able to work with individuals around the world, but from wherever I want to. If I want to do it in the Maldives, I can do it. If I want to do it in Sicily, I can do it. If I want to do it in Ghana, Brazil, Canada, North America, I can do it. And I don't want to be have to be tied to an actual location. So yeah, that's the energy that I'm coming with. So so I love it, but I have to ask a question because you, you talked a little bit uh, earlier on in this conversation where you went, um, you can address the needs of potential clients from all over the world in different time zones. Yeah. Um, yeah. There, there are two things that sort of caught my interest in that. The first one was how much of an interest is there in developing cultural competence when you are, say, in Latin America or in, say, uh, parts of Asia, because 
in many cases, at least in the case of Asia, I can speak, um, it's such a homogenous culture in many cases, like each individual place, that the idea of you need to develop cultural competence to talk about other cultures is is nearly foreign. At least, at least my experiences were. Because um, so, how do how do you sort of address the fact that it's not a need for them, but it's probably a good idea for them to develop that if they're trying to grow grow a global business? Yeah. So the, the a large, I would say, the large proportion of my clients tend to be global companies with footprints in all these different regions. So um, if I can kind of like give examples, they're on my website, so it's, it's not secret. So if you're talking about working with a Google or a Facebook or a Lloyds Bank or an HSBC bank, all these organizations have global footprints all over the world. And one of the things that was really important for me is to, to take people on a journey to recognize that um, I have a phrase where I say that um, inclusion is global, but diversity is local. So if you're working for an organization and you want people to have a sense of belonging, to be that Googler, to be that person who's in that organization, who's following a, a, you know, a specific kind of value set, a global value set, that's fine in terms of the way you want them to feel part of the team, the way you attract them, the way you recruit them or what have you. But in terms of practices locally, they will be different. And so part of the wider conversation to your point, excuse me, I just had sesame. Sorry, I had cashew nuts before I spoke to you. I think they're starting to come out of my lips. This, this is a problem. I'm allergic to cashews. Oh, well, we're miles away. We're good. We're good. Um, but what, what was really interesting is, is so for example, there were, um, I would work with a, a, a client in, in say South America, where say a conversation around race and ethnicity may be really fraught how you navigate that space. And so what I would do is rather than saying, right, I'm just going to just narrow in on that piece. What I think is very important for you to do as an individual is to think about how you just want to treat somebody as a human who may come from a different background from the new, a different class, different gender, different orientation. And again, speaking to your, your concept of, of homogeneity, there's still divisions. You know, if you go to China, there's going to be the, the Han majority uh, in certain cities like Hong Kong and other places. But then you'll realize you're, they're going to be a, a Vietnamese cohort. There's going to be a Bengali cohort. There's going to be an Indian cohort. There's going to be a Singaporean co a cohort. And then, they, then all the kind of European and, and, and other African cohorts, even though they may be in a minority, they're there. How do you work, especially if you're trying to get a customer base that is global? Or if you have, if you are part of a global organization and somebody in the UK decides that they want to relocate to Argentina, or somebody in Singapore realizes that they want to go to Australia. How do you understand the mannerisms and, and the way that people work in those spaces? And how do you get to ask better questions? So even though there were lots of resistance, especially when we first started having the conversation, lots of individuals were very resistant to it because they were thinking, well, look, I don't want somebody coming here and telling me that I'm wrong about the way I see religion or caste or race or orientation or what have you. I said, that's not my role to be able to teach you that. What I will do is I'll take you on a journey to go, hold on, there's a blind spot that you may not necessarily realize that can have a real massive impact on your performance, not locally, but definitely in a global context. And it's those openings and it's those kinds of realizations that have been really powerful um, as part of the journey. So yeah, I've, I've enjoyed that. It's been challenging, but I've really enjoyed it. But it's, it's really interesting. You talk about this idea of... Um of enhancing performance. But before we get into the enhancing performance, one of the areas I think is fraught with, with problems is, is um, a term you used a few seconds ago, which I think is exactly right, which is this checkbox mentality. This idea that, oh, you know what? I need to provide diversity training. Check that box. Have someone come in, do a talk for two hours, and then we're done. Move on to the next thing on another day. How do you, how do you get people to stop thinking about it as a checkbox, you've done the training, now you're good, to know this is something, this needs to be included in your perspective every single day, every single moment that you're sort of um, helping people and, and working with your clients, which which is how it's gonna improve your performance. I tell them it's bloody hard work. I tell them it's hard work. I just say from the get-go, this is gonna be hard work. This is not gonna be easy. It's so important to understand that anything worth getting is gonna be hard work. It's gonna take a lot of, of, of self-reflection, and it's going to take a lot of reflection of the impact that we have around us. So, for example, being really inclusive in your leadership is not just about your staff, but it's also about your customer base. It's also about your supply chain. It's also about the way that you develop products and be innovative. 
So it's not, to your point, it's not just about ticking a box, but actually looking across the spectrum and going, okay, if we take a step back from this and we look at this strategically and having a real sense of how we're going to look as, 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 as in terms of a business, how are we going to do this differently? Let me give you a really um, a, a blatant example of this. So let's take uh, Northern European or North American um, positionings around leadership. It's very much about you be in a meeting, don't hold back, speak your mind, radical candor, say what it is. If people get offended, we just need to be able to speak it because that's how we move. And then I go to Asia Pacific, and there it's very much around respect for somebody who's an elder. You do not interrupt somebody who's older than you. Um, you it's more about quiet leadership. So rather than being outspoken, it's about, listen, I need to demonstrate what I do, and then you pick it up. And there's a marrying of worlds where promotion and performance on this side of the world in North America and Northern Europe is about show and tell, personal brand, make sure you're out there, make sure you're writing articles and make sure that you blow your own trumpet. Whereas uh, in, in other cultures, there's something like, you know, you just actually just need to just get your head down, work really hard, 12 hour a day, and, you know, and, and then somebody else will be able to see you. And part of the conversation that I have with individuals is how do we marry the two? How do we get you to understand that if you are working with that environment, uh, with a global environment, these are the expectations and these are the way that things are done. And how can we do it differently? How can we blend both this outward kind of very um, outspoken leadership with this really quiet and more reserved one and see where there's a way where we can have a sense of understanding? And that's one of the reasons why I said to you it's about learning, not training, because what we're doing is we're asking better questions. We're removing assumptions. I'm not going to come into somebody's company or country and make an assumption that I know what you do and that what I'm bringing to you is best. I'm going to ask you about what works. I'm going to talk to you about what works elsewhere. And then we find a way of being able to meld the two. So so you're talking about this this idea that um, you, you're going to melt and, and, um, and, and get these these individuals to to see the world in in a different way, and it's as you put it, it's bloody hard work. Mm -hmm. If that's true, um, how one of the things that uh, every company wants to do is to tie it to benchmarks. So, how do you know you've been successful in the training? Again, again, like as you said, it's down to benchmarks. We agree. What does a good outcome look like? What you know, when you are dealing with something like inclusion, it's, it's very difficult to do it when you're, it's not widgets, right? It's not this product, it's not the amount of Teslas you've actually sold. It's not the amount of, um, you know, uh, the, the the cost of acquisition that you've done on some kind of like e-commerce platform. It's not as tangible as those really hard and fast ones. So the, so the, um, the, the, the metrics have to change. So we do things like net promoter score, which is like, um, for those who don't know, if you really want to find out how engaged your customers are, you do surveys and they do that survey, they talk you through their customer experience. So you can have that net promoter score for your actual customers. But we also do ones for employees where an employee can do, whether it's in the open or under the um, cloak of anonymity, can really talk about their experience. And then we use that to gauge how engaged it is. We look at retention figures. We look at... Um, the amount of money an organization may have paid in legal fees because of disputes that they may have had around employability or issues that they may have had around suppliers. So there are all these other points within the organization, all these other metrics, whether it's employee engagement, whether it's the retention, whether it's the legal fees, um, uh, and, and any any other of those touch points that we have, which may not be as hard and fast as like a financial, like a liquidity ratio or, or any of the other things that we may have in a finance space, but there are definitely one in the people space that once we're agreed on, we can actually look on. Like I'll give you the one about retention, for example. Um, in any organization, if you get rid of somebody who's senior, it costs you some upwards of two and a half to three times their salary to get somebody back in there. So that's the amount of effort. That's the equivalent amount it costs to be able to get them to go through the whole interview process, to, to whittle in, you know, when you start to, to think about all the people that need to go through that process to recruit that person, plus the recruiting fees, plus the time they take away from their normal day job, plus the seven or eight step process, it can be two to three times more. So what we say is if you are at the, uh, the get go, if you can retain those individuals, you reduce your costs and you are able to uh, not only reduce the cost of recruiting people, but reducing the cost of any kind of issue that may come as a result of conflict. 
when people start to look at those hard figures, trust me, those benchmarks start to make a big difference to them. And it re people go, oh my God, I didn't even think about that. And I go, yeah, because you've been focusing on this. And the reason why we do this is we're not looking at, in we're looking at inclusion first and foremost from a, from a human um, lens. We want people to come into an organization and feel respected, have a sense of worthwhileness. You're spending the majority of your day or week doing this stuff. So at least, you know, enjoy the process. But the second bit is, is if you mess it up, the cost of you, I used to be an accountant, just to, just to, just a quick one, right? But when you look at it, the cost of your bottom line and the way that you have actually um, effectively could be draining money, there are ways of making better cost savings by focusing on those key things. So, so let me ask you this question because I'm, I'm, I'm curious. I, I love this idea that you're tying it to the bottom line, and, and that raises its own questions of, um, of sort of you have to, as they put it, open the kimono and show you what's really like how much they're losing in legal fees, for example. Um, and and I imagine some companies are a little bit more hesitant to to provide that type of transparency. But obviously, it speaks to exactly how valuable that would be to them. But yeah. but the 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 question I have, um, and and this is sort of a social media uh, storm, if you will, mm -hmm. is um, how do you? On one hand, you have to be culturally competent. You have to include people, make them feel a part of it. But how do you also handle the opposite of this, which is cultural appropriation, mm -hmm. and and avoid people? Um, behaving in a way that takes away, I guess. And I don't fully understood the concept of, of cultural appropriation. So I'd love for you to explain that a little bit more and, and give me your perspective on um, how can it be done right? How is it done wrong um, and what it means? So uh, it, there's, there's so many, as you quietly qualified about, you know, social media, there's so many of these phrases that can go flying left, right and center. I think, so my understanding is cultural appropriation is when you go to another culture and what you do is you exploit it for your commercial or personal benefit without giving due respect to that culture. Whereas cultural appreciation for me is being able to like, say, for example, there was a, um, uh, there's a, a manufacturing process, I think it's called just in time, which is mm -hmm. a Japanese concept, okay? Being able to implement that and use it within your, in, within your organization for me, I think that's cultural appreciation because you've understood that technicalities of productivity from a Japanese point of view, and it can help not only in car manufacturing, but in so many other um, uh, issues where you want to have really tight processes and productivity. On the flip side, if we have an all cultural day and I dress up and I paint myself in white paint and put on a geisha outfit, which, we can, which is a really scary image, but I just wanted to give you as extreme as, as possible. And I do that and I started to mimic, say, the, uh, a Japanese language, that for me is cultural appropriation and that's in many ways that's insulting and and, and not giving respect to the culture from where it's once it whence it came and, and very often there are individuals who will do that regardless and i say well just have a think about it if that's your customer or your supplier or the territory you're working in what's the kind of impact that can have and even if it's not what are you saying to your employees about the the wider breadth and the wider remit of who you have impact on that you don't really have that amount of respect for it. Yeah, yeah. If I did look like that, it'd be very scary. But you know, you, you know, you if if that was done, you know, what's the wider impact? And not just to dismiss it as something that's just humorous or banterous, because in a global world, you know, once upon a time, these things would have been behind closed doors and and what have you, and people would have felt comfortable enough to do that. Now, all it just takes is one employee to be able to take that stuff and put it on LinkedIn or Instagram or TikTok or Snapchat. And the commercial damage and the, the the marketing damage that can be done because the culture hasn't been managed properly is devastating. And so I always say to people, just be really just be really mindful. You're you're more under uh, a microscope or in a, in a in a in a in a global space now. Be very very mindful of what that actually looks like. And you know there are people who will confuse it and say, oh, you're being really political correct and nobody can have any sense of humor. I'm not saying that you don't have a sense of humor. I'm just saying that when you are using humor, especially within the, the, the fact that the impact it can have on your brand or on your corporate positioning, is just think carefully about it. You know, um, like I last year when we had this, uh, the, the whole issue around Black Lives Matter in the UK, somebody said to me, you know, I feel really bad. I can't even use the word blackmail or I, I can't use the word like a black bag. And I'm like, well, why not? Because yeah, I don't want to offend you. I'm like, well, firstly, I don't look like male. 
technically I don't look like a bag, right? So I'm not going to be offended by that. And and what I realize is that there is a there is this very thin line. And again, if we bring in this whole social media thing, that you know, these notions of cancel culture, I will say, yeah. to people, oh, you can't cancel me. I'll say what the hell I want. You can't cancel me because at the end of the day, you have no idea where my income streams are coming from. And and anything I say on social media, I'm going to say to you in your face, and I'm going to say it, but I'm going to be respectful of how I say it. So, for example, I can be very um, just as a, as a really um, uh, quick analogy, there are some times where I will write, where I will specifically spell out racial slurs. I will not say the N word. I will not say the P word. I will spell it out as it is on there. And I will say to individuals, this is what people are saying. And I want you to feel uncomfortable. I want you to feel uncomfortable with that word because I want you to understand the impact it can have on individuals. And it makes you second guess. Yes, I've written it. And you're thinking, oh my God, you wrote that. I couldn't write that. That's a whole other conversation altogether. But I want you to understand how uncomfortable it will feel. Like, you know, I have asked members of the LGBT community, can I use, a, if I'm writing something, can I use the term queer in order to be able to describe something? And they said, yes, absolutely fine, as long as it's descriptive. And again, it's just being really, really appreciative of the audience that you're having so that when you're doing it, you're not doing it to appropriate that term and go, right, you know, a couple of gay and lesbian people tell me I can use queer and I can use it whatever I want, but rather it's appreciation of that culture and what it means for those individuals who gave me permission to speak on their behalf or alongside them, it's a real appreciation of what that is. I hope that makes sense. It does, it does. But it it also tells me a little bit about um, how that, that line starts blurring. I'll, I'll give you an example. Yes. Um, we, were, I, I live in Philadelphia in the US and yeah. um, they were opening up a Chinese restaurant, I believe, yeah. and, uh, or, let's assume it's Chinese because I can't remember the, uh, the details, but essentially a white man was going to open up a Chinese restaurant and yeah. they accused him of cultural appropriation yeah. and said that he shouldn't be doing that. Yeah. He's taking away from the Chinese culture. I personally couldn't understand why that's true, but mm -hmm. I'd be curious um, what interpretation allows that to be true. Yeah. Uh, and so I, so I, I, I don't think it's cultural appropriation. Um, if, Again, if the if the individual was going to do it and have like the image that we've had here, and I know it's a Japanese one, but if the equivalent yeah. of a Chinese person was there and it was in such a way that it was not respectful of that culture, then I would have an issue with it. Like, you know, I live here in the UK and I can tell you the two biggest brands of Caribbean food cuisine in the UK are not owned by Caribbean people. All right? I'll tell you that straight up. They're owned by Europeans. Um, and and for me, I'm like, just as long as you cook my food good, I don't get it. Just as long as you don't come with stupid, insulting, like, um, accents or what have you, or as long as you're respectful of the culture, I'm okay with it. And so, you know, look, the majority of what they will call Indian restaurants in the UK are actually Bengali. Right. But you tell that to people. They, you know, and, and, and sometimes it actually makes me laugh because there are times where, you know, there, are, there, there has been in the UK, there's been a, a huge element of, say, Islamophobia in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, huge, huge, you know, even before 2016 when we had Brexit, huge elements of Islamophobia. And I laughed to myself because I'm thinking there was all these people being Islamophobic, but you're eating halal meat from that Bengali <laughs> you get your curry and rice. Do you realize what halal meat actually is? <laughs> so I it to myself and I just think, you just actually don't understand the full scope of this. And I guess right. part of the conversation is, is, um, is being able to understand. And I'll give you a really quick um, yeah. Part of the last rule that I give to some of my clients, I say, look, we we need to have what I call brave conversations, and in these brave conversations, it's going to be to your point. I, I think in America um, about uh, uh, the Washington Redskins, for example, as a football team, yeah, and the change yeah. in that name. I thought, for me, when I was looking at it, I thought, you know what, I actually understand why they did that because there is so much stuff that has happened around Native American, and Redskin is a pejorative term. So even though you may have feel comfortable with it, if somebody is still caught I'm going to use the word here on your podcast, just for the sake of argument. Just give me the bandwidth for this. Yes. Question. If the team was called the Washington Niggers, for the sake of argument, right? If you felt comfortable with that, that's not the issue. The fact is, is that in some way, if somebody's doing that, can you imagine the commentator trying to get that <laughs> name out who's non-black, like, oh, the Washington N-word, <laughs> or the, you know, you know that would be, it would be so sensitive. Yes. So for me, I thought it was important for individuals to have that larger conversation. And then there were those who pushed back and said, oh, you're messing up the traditions. Of no, there were individuals who have seen that as a pejorative term for all their life. 
So if an organization can sit down and go, well, do you know what? On reflection, that's not right. You know, the whole concept of the headhunter redskin narrative was really pejorative. We can rebrand it. All companies can rebrand at some point in time. We can do that. And, and the way I approach that is I say, when you're having that brave conversation, there's four ways to approach it. The first one is to come with really good intent. Don't assume that somebody's coming with a really bad ax to grind, especially when we talk about inclusion. Some people are, but let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Let's approach with right. love. And we go with love. All the major religions in the world, all the major philosophies in the world, we all start with love. Let's love that person. Let's show them appreciation, whether it's namaste, whether it's agape, whether it's love, we come with love, all right? We do that, we make the assumption, but what we, sorry, we, yeah, we make the assumption that everybody's coming from a good place. But the big piece here is being able to also say, whilst I assume that you're coming from a really good place, I also want you to be really aware that in that same essence of love, do not be afraid to be challenged by me, by something you may not fully understand, all right? Um, and and likewise, the, the next level is about language. So, um, uh, and I'm going to answer that question from Jenna, by the way. Um, and the, the, the next bit of this is, is language. So there's all these language terms going out. You know, I don't want to do this because these people are woke and it's politically correct and da 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 and privilege and all the rest of it. And I go, okay, let's understand what we mean by that. So, for example, one of the ways I was able to define privilege last year to a group of individuals is I used myself as an example. I said, look, my name's David McQueen. I don't have to anglicize it. So wherever I go, I don't have the problem in major corporate spaces where people go, oh, how do you pronounce that? Or, or what does that mean? It's David McQueen. I know it's very simple. That, that four syllables roll off your tongue is absolutely fine. I'm six foot two. So when I walk into rooms, I know that there's a presence I will have by being tall. There's a bias towards tall people, okay? I have a deep voice. So when I speak, I know that that resonance as a speaker, it lands really well. I'm a straight man married with two children. I know having that family unit also gives me a privilege to be able to access place. I don't have to come out to be straight, right? I don't have to come out to talk about my relationship. You know, I run my own business. I live in uh, uh, in suburbia. All these things are privileges that allow me to navigate the world in a certain space. I get onto a plane and I turn left. I don't turn right, right? That's a privilege that's afforded me, okay? And I say that so people can understand this is what privilege looks like. These are certain things that you don't have to think about because you just do it as standard. But sometimes that also translates over to race, as it does to religion, as it does to gender. Understanding that rather than going, oh my God, I never had it because I was working class and I worked my way from, from, my, from my way up. I totally get that and that's fine. But if you and I are walking down the road, somebody can make an assumption about the two of us just based on the way that we look. And that's where privilege plays in. So we talk about the language, we talk about listening, asking better questions, and I'm definitely going to answer Janan, uh, Janan's question in a moment. Hope I pronounced your name right, Janan. Um, and, um, and, and then we, we listen better, ask better questions. And then the last one is how do we take all that information and then leverage it so it works for the better good? And so I, I ask, love it. Is, if it's Janan or Janan, or just please tell it's me. It's Janan. It's Janan. Okay, I was right first yep. time. So does being part of a marginalized group then make it okay to critique the group? Um, I'm not sure. Are you talking about the group that you're in or another group? Assume the group you're in because okay. she said the group. But yeah, okay. um, I think you should be able to critique any group. I honestly think you should be able to critique. We're adults. We're not kids. We should be able to critique anything. The fact that we're terrified to speak out on those things for me shows that we're going to hell in a handbasket. I should, somebody should be able to come up to me and say to me, David, I, I, I'm really uncomfortable about um, using the N word or, or I'm really uncomfortable about the fact that you may have used the P word or, or any other kind of pejorative term. And I'll say, well, okay, that's fine. And I absolutely get you, but let's have a discussion about that. So I'm going to use the word, I'm going to, for, for the purpose of demonstration, if it's okay with you, sir, I'm going to, uh, Darshan, I'm going to use it here. There's a pejorative term that's used in the UK. A four-letter word, P-A-K-I. I'm going to pronounce it just for the pronunciation. I'm with it. People have used the term Paki to be able to refer to everybody of South Asian or what we call Desi heritage in the UK. For me, that undermines the fact that there are so many countries, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, um, uh, uh, Pakistan, India, and, and all those in those regions. And to sum that up in one pejorative term, you miss it. So when I write it, I'm doing it to say to you, this is how stupid it actually sounds. Do you realize that you're missing out on so much of the heritage here and so much of what's involved in it? But I say to people, challenge me on it. There's nothing I say that I'm afraid to be challenged on. 
but people are terrified that you might get put in, you know, oh, you might get cancer. We're grown people. We're not these dribbling people in tenor pants who can't make decisions for ourselves. We can actually start to have a serious conversation. And that's why I say that I use that model of wherever we are. If we can start with that a place, the assumption of love, and we're coming from a good place, identify what we're using for language. Yes, we can critique it. Yes, we can explore it. But I think we should do it to the end where we're really having an examination of what things are, seeing how the way the world is, and what can we do to make it better, as opposed to just critiquing it as opposed to just pulling it down, as opposed to just going, oh, like everybody's like this in the group. Let's go and have a look at that and explore some of our assumptions on our objectives around that. So I'm going to ask you one last question. Usually, as you know, I, I aim for these to be about 15, 20 minutes. We're at 35 already. So okay. we've been talking for a little bit, but um, it's always so super fun to actually have these conversations, especially with you, uh, especially because you're so comfortable just going, let's riff. But uh, I'm going to ask you a question because of a comment you made, which is beautifully on point. Um, the question I have is, you talked about um, the the um, Chinese food, and you were talking about how you don't have a problem with um, someone making... Oh, actually, no, that's not how you phrase it. You said you were talking about Caribbean food, mm -hmm. and you talked about how uh, it's the, the two largest Caribbean food makers in the, U uh, in the EU uh, and the UK are Europeans. Um, and you're like, as long as they make good, delicious food that respect the, the heritage, I am, I'm, I'm totally okay with that. My question to you yeah. is there's, there's a famous, um, brand in the U S called Trader Joe's. Uh, have mm -hmm. you ever heard of it? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Trader Joe's has some, um, has some delicious Indian, Indian food. And I go there and I, and I pick it up and eat it every so often. makes me feel happy, blah, blah, blah. But you, you start seeing, um, Indian food where you're going, I don't recognize these ingredients. Some things like putting pineapple in Indian food. I'm going, look, there's no Indian food that has pineapple. But on one hand, I'm kind of going, okay, that doesn't appeal to me. Who am I to decide if Indian food should have pineapples? A really good example of that, quite honestly, is in the UK. Um, I, I've heard rumors. And I have no idea if it's true or not. But Balti chicken, which is something that you guys consider to be a, a core part of Indian food was, from what, what I gather, was never made in India. It was actually made in the UK. And um, and it's, it's enhanced the food. So how do you draw the distinction between a Balti chicken that's improved the food and a pineapple being added to some, I'll call it tasteless Indian food? And what's, what is the uh, gap? Is that is that inclusive and is that uh, appreciation or is that appropriation? It's the same as Vindaloo, right? I've, I've, I've asked. I've, no I've idea. asked people, I'm like, they're like, what the hell is Vindaloo? I've been all around India. I've no. never seen that dish. No one knows what that is, right? And 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 I, you know, part of I, I have this. Um, uh, I, I love I love rotis. Uh, rotis. I really love rotis. Yeah. But I have found there's a massive distinction between the rotis that you can get in a restaurant and the rotis I get when I go to my friend's house. Yep. Very very texture color. Yeah. Very very, very different. And I guess. Part of it, and coming back to the Trader Joe's thing, look, you know, the, the, the point I was making about the Caribbean restaurants, they have this thing about, they, they come across this concept called jerk. So jerk mm -hmm. is just a form of seasoning that you have. Yeah. But I think yeah. like jerk pineapple. I'm like, like you, I'm like, are you mad? What? What's, what? <laughs> jerk pineapple? Like, what are you smoking? What are you having behind there? And I guess the, the reason why I am, I, I am not so offended by it per se is that, um, there's always going to be they. There's always going to be going to that line and, and doing that stuff. I just know for me, it's just not something that I'm going to get engaged in. And you know, even when we think about those restaurants and what have you that aren't owned by the 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 um the community whose food it's representing, you always know there's going to be a different look. Mexican food in Taco Bell or the equivalent, right? Oh my, yes, right. Jerk pineapple, like come on, <laughs> jerk pineapple cilantro. <laughs> What are you smoking? Okay. <laughs> but it's like, you know, t Taco Bell or what have you. It's not Mexican. It's not true Mexican food. It is not. If but you there is Tex-Mex, and that's a whole different genre. But this is what I'm saying. So there are, what you realize is that there are some things that will be commercially done in some spaces that will suit a certain palate, and that will allow people to go and buy it. And I'm like, do you know what? At the end of the day, there are some hills I wish to die on, and that's not one of them. Okay, that's not one of them. If you're going to do jerk chicken and pineapple, 
knock yourself out. I'll stay at home and I'll cook my own food, you know. Um, and again, yeah, to your point that, you know, Ch Trader Ming and Arabian Joe, I think it's very different in, in, in America. There seems to be a, um, a, a culture that the way they will um, uh, adopt some of that stuff is very different. But I, I think that's insensitive. You know, when you are using some terms or labels like that, you know, the Jose and the Arabian and the Ming, it, it really feeds into this horrible colonial mindset of this is how we're going to categorize everything. And often, you know, I, I think it was Uncle Ben's rice last year that they had to rename it. And I think Aunt Jemima on the, on the front of some other thing, because those terms were really, really pejorative. And by the force of protest, they were able to move. Likewise, I think people should be able to go, this is, this is not acceptable. Because when I see Trader Ming, I think of Ming in um, Flash Gordon. And I know Ming in Flash Gordon was not a child. It was a white guy with his eyes being painted. And that was offensive as hell. As much as I may have liked it when I was seven or eight, like a 52-year-old man, I'm thinking, you lot were really pushing the boat out here. But again, mm -hmm. I think it's a conversation. We just need to choose which hills or which battles we need to fight in the grander scheme. Wonderful. Um, as you know, uh, we have we're well past time at this point, but I do have a couple of questions before we let you go. Um, so the first question, the, the the first question we've been answering the whole way through, which is how can people contact you? And we've been showing your website, which is davidmcqueen.co.uk. We've also been showing your Twitter account, which is uh, Mr. David McQueen underscore. Uh, am I right in saying that the underscore is supposed to be there, or did I just copy it? It is. It is supposed to be there. Okay. I, okay. I tried to get the other one, and somebody beat me to it, so I had to. <laughs> <laughs> what, what I what I think is actually is especially hilarious about this is how you told me right before we came on that you hate the fact that we've now reached an age where we get the Mister before the name. Right. Right. Except that's the Twitter name you chose, so there's that. <laughs> I, but somebody beat me to it. But I'm more I am more active in terms of content on LinkedIn than I am on Twitter. Definitely LinkedIn is where I do a lot more thought pieces and really have that provocative discussion around what we spoke about. And again, you know, I, I, I am, I'm provocative with intent in that I know that there are some people who will shy away from having this kind of conversation. And I think for some of the more challenging conversations, I have more responses in my inbox than I do have online, but that's fine because it informs my practice. It informs seeing these different points of view and learning a lot of stuff. So yeah, I'm, I'm definitely for that. And by the do way, you, you, know, you know we can never do a half an hour conversation. So let's just. <laughs> let's I going. always try. It's but it's so fun to have these conversations. But but I have to I have to ask: Do you feel that you have a privilege in being able to have these conversations in a way that a white man could not? You can you can say the p word, you can say the n word, because um, you you come from a as a, as a black man, you have that privilege. And if if I was a white man. I, I couldn't touch those two words without yeah. probably being potentially stoned in public. Yeah. But the, but you again, if if the context is correct, uh -huh. it, it's so it, it it strikes me as it being it's I can only find the word. It's stupid that as individuals we cannot use descriptive terms or words and be able to explain the pejorative nature of something without being shut down. If a white man was going to be able to use the N-word and say that in terms of being able to explain a point, I don't have a problem with that. I mean, obviously, don't drop it in there 15 times because I'm like, dude, you could have said that once. <laughs> <laughs> I know where you're going now, right? We, we know where you live. But I think it, I think it's it becomes... It, it's, I'll tell you what it does. It stops the sensible conversations happening in sensible spaces. It pushes them to the fringe, and then we end up with January the 6th at Capitol Hill. Very, very, very inter interesting perspective. Absolutely, I, I love the the idea that if you push those conversations underneath and and hide, try to hide them, they will come out in the more extremist areas, and yeah. and that leads to more problems. Um, so my question for you, uh, what would you like to ask the audience? Ooh. So this is I didn't get to ask you this last time. Okay. Okay. The only reason I don't work in pharma. Right? Mm -hmm. It's because they don't pay bills on time. Is that true? That's the only reason I do not work in pharma. Huh. I'm fascinated by the industry. I'm fascinated by um, that there is an obsession with, obviously, the domination of big pharma and the impact that it can have on doctors and the healthcare space as a, as a whole. 
But the principle of pharmaceuticals, you know, the, all the nonsense that's happened around misinformation around vaccines, you know, yeah. I was, the other day I was re reading some really powerful stuff around CRISPR and some pharma stuff around dealing with sickle cell, which is a, a, a you know, that the disease that affects um, predominantly um, black African Americans. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, that stuff fascinates me, but it gets shut down mainly because everybody focuses on big pharma. But the reason I don't work with farmers because they just don't pay it here. They don't pay on time. And I'm not working for anybody. I, I've got to pay my bills, pay my bloody invoice. I'm not waiting three months because I know you're yeah. bloody shipping, flipping anodin and zycrofen or whatever the hell it is. And you're getting paid for that. Pay my damn yeah. bills. I'm fascinated by the actual space. And I'm fascinated by having conversations in uh, leadership in that space. And so what I would love to ask the audience, I suppose, from a global point of view, it, it would be, what are the most pressing or challenging issues in in leadership and culture in the farmer industry? That would be my question to the audience. That is such a great question. That is that is genuinely one of the best questions I've received before. Be because I want to start with the first question, yeah. and then I'll go into the larger question you've asked. So the first question, which you wasn't a question, and I'm going to answer anyways, was why does pharma not pay its bills on time? Um, so there are two two responses to that. The first one is actually it's a known problem because um, I when I attend these clinical research um, programs, uh, inevitably you will have um, one of those um, sort of sessions be why does far so so you have these doctors' offices that are doing research right, and they'll do the work say in January they'll invoice at the end of January then they have ninety days to pay just because that's the that's the timeline. So between the time the, the first work is done, say on January 1st, they aren't getting paid uh, at the, at the uh, potentially at least till April 30th. Yeah. Which is why to your point, that's, um, so so when you actually look at how these clinical trials get done, these, these doctor's offices actually land up having to go into the negative for a certain period of time until the money starts coming back in. Yeah. And and that's been a huge problem. The way that's been addressed by a lot of companies, by a lot of sites, uh, which is what you call these doctors' offices. Which, uh, what you do is you actually either ask for uh, a site uh, a a site fee, basically, for us to start the clinical trial and essentially get an upfront payment, or um, you actually land up asking for some kind of escrow payment um, yeah. that you'll pull from and that needs to be renewed every so often. Yes. Um, it's a problem that lawyers face all the time, which is why we literally have special lawyer accounts called IOLTA accounts that effectively act as as escrow accounts. Yeah, yeah. And but but your point is interesting. I've never had anyone else say this. I thought it was primarily a clinical research problem. I'll be honest. Outside, I, I get it's not just pharma. Right now, I have a client who hasn't paid me in nine months, and it's not a pharma client. Um, but but and I've had clients who have. And I'm, I still consider that client a potential payer. Um, I, I haven't closed the books on them, but my point being, not just a pharma issue, it seems to be a larger company issue, yeah. um, and, and they sort of squeeze themselves. To your, to your second question, though, which is culturally, what are, um, what are problems they, they face? What, what are problems that pharma faces? I think the biggest difference is when you're talking about these global multicultural uh, companies, and I'm coming at it from a compliance um, perspective, um, you start seeing people who are trying to push the envelope, whether you're talking about in science going, I want to be conservative, and I want to uh, do the right thing as what whatever's expected. But at the same time, uh, I need this company to be successful. Uh, if you do it right, you'll get, um, you'll, you'll get a lot of very successful pharma companies that, that sort of do it right. But if you do it wrong, what you get is a Theranos, and you have everything else that comes out of that. Um, so, so you get the people who are over aggressive bosses. You yeah. get the people who are uh, over aggressive salespeople. You you get the people who are trying to convince investors about something that may or may not be true. I think there there is a cultural reckoning happening in pharma and medical devices right now, yeah. uh, which is several years ago. Um, all these large, huge, multi-billion, multi-trillion dollar tech companies were coming in saying, we will change the way health works in the in the US, if not globally. And slowly in the last two months, Google said that they're shutting down their health division. 
Apple saying that that they're shutting down the health division. Um, Haven, which was supposed to be uh, um, JP Morgan, uh, you, you, the three big companies. I'm yeah, blanking yeah. on them. Yeah, Amazon, um, else. Amazon. Yeah, Amazon was another one. They all sort of just said we're shutting down. Yeah. So, so you there's a cultural clash going on, uh, and and one of those elements of that cultural clash was this idea that um, it's okay to to break things but move on quickly till you get a version two that's better and just yeah. keep improving iteratively. That cultural difference between um, break things and move on versus get it, get it right the first time mm. is honestly a big massive difference yeah. in cost. Yeah. Um, and 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 that's a big cultural issue they're facing as well. I know you were looking for more of a, a diversity angle. Oh, no, I know that, no. right? that's 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 part that's part of it. Remember the, the inclusive bit is only only a, a small part of the larger pie. And again, you know, for for me the, I've seen the mergers that have happened here, but I've yeah. also seen in a, a lot of the, the countries where ancestors of mine are from, when you're thinking about things like HIV treatments, or even right now when you're thinking about, you know, we we literally walked out of our house, my wife and I jumped in a car five minutes down the road, AstraZeneca in your left arm, Bob's your uncle and you kept kept it moving. Whereas other people, other eras or countries now, there's this dumping. And this dumping has meant that there is a really low take-up rate because they're like, why are you giving us your cheap vaccines? Or why yeah. can't we develop it ourselves? And why are you yeah. treating them this way? And so for me, I'm really curious from a, I, I very quickly, I have a model that I use around my inclusive leadership. It's called Brave. So I say leaders need to be bold. They need to be resilient. They need to be agile. They need to be visionary, but they need to be ethical. And for me, it's that E piece here. Lots of people are bold, lots of people are agile, and all the, but that ethical piece here, and that tends to be the sticking point for me. And I think that's at some point, maybe I will just, you know, just go, all right, screw it. I'm just going to go and do a couple of things with some pharmaceutical companies. But that tends to be the pushback for me. And I'm just really, really curious from the ground up, what does that, and I've done, to be fair, I've done about four or five speeches for pharmaceutical companies, and my speeches get paid up front. So that's very different. You pay me in advance. But others, yeah, I'm like you keep it. A lovely contract. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm, let me go and get some. Let me go and get some um, curry pineapple somewhere. I'm good. <laughs> uh, so here's your next question. What's something you've learned in the last month? Oh, crypto. Whew. Right. I've been learning about NFTs and DAOs. Right. So the D DAO being that. Um, distributed autonomous authority or something like that. So where that's managed and then NFTs, the whole concept around that. I'm fascinated by it. I think it's crazy. I think you're probably going to get like everything, one to 2% of that space will work. But yeah. I'm fascinated by the decentralizing of finance and how much it's frightening the hell out of traditional fiat and economics. China literally in the last week has shut down cryptocurrency. Yep, China. yep. Literally shut it down. Because it's a threat. It's a massive threat to their, you know, you've got these massive companies now who are indebted up to their eyeballs. And someone goes, okay, well, we just buy it through through Bitcoin. No one can track you. Um, we'll have a ledger. And if, you know, if it needs to, but we have that, um, you know, in control. So going out and looking at a bit more around crypto and looking at NFT and DAO, I'm looking at it more from a research point of view. But it's, I actually think that, flip, quick flip to this, I actually think that the blockchain come bearing in mind what you were just talking about with a lot of these companies trying to disrupt healthcare i understand about getting it right and what have you but in terms of managing the the actual process of going through the whole pharmaceutical and drug cycle and what have you if blockchain got into that space and i think far the larger pharmaceutical companies if they realize that it, it would mess things up and that's why i think there's a big resistance so i'm fascinated by fascinated by blockchain so, cryptocurrency. so two parts to that yeah. Number one, I hate to tell you this, but farmers already gotten into blockchain. There, I have, I know loads of people in the blockchain world. In fact, if you want, I'm, I'm happy to send you a couple of links. Please um, do. I've done a couple of interviews and stuff with people who are blockchain gurus. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so I'll, I'll send that, that to you. So, I think you might find that interesting. Uh, you mentioned China. Uh, did you look at El Salvador though? The flip side of China. El Salvador went out and said, "We're going to consider that currency." Yeah. And and so the question is the 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 impact of China versus the impact of El Salvador is vastly different. Yes. Um, but but we don't know where that's going to lead. But that's kind of 
interesting to me. Um, and, and the U.S. is still trying to figure out what they're thinking off with uh, with blockchain and stuff. There, I believe they said they see it as, and I could, I please don't quote me on this. Um, they see it as an asset, not as currency. So, um, so it's a long term asset. So the, the idea being that we will tax you when you sell it and buy it. We will not tax you uh, as ordinary income. So I think yeah. that should be interesting. But I believe the UK treats it the same way. I think a lot of the European Union is treating yeah. it the same way, but I think that's evolving as we speak. Yes. So we'll see how that goes. Um, last question. What is something that made you happy in the last week? Outside Barbados, to be honest. Yeah. Um, my two things. My daughter, youngest daughter, um, has gone back to college, university uh, in the north of England here. And what's really made me happy is just seeing her go into that space and really get a sense of who she is as a woman. Obviously, she's like, I'm away from my parents. I'm going to do what the hell I want. But <laughs> last year, her first year was obviously quite restricted because of COVID. But now yeah. being able to go to live lectures and get the full university experience has been quite exciting for me for that. And the second thing for me has been my eldest daughter. She works in television. And she has been making her way up the ladder in terms of directing. And has been on a couple of shows on Netflix and the BBC. And she's doing really well, building a reputation. So to see my offspring stepping into adulthood in that way made me totally happy. Definitely happy. Very, very cool. Um, you know you know, we're going to have to bring you back. And we're going to just repeat this again. For those people who want to reach out to you, they can reach find you on LinkedIn at uh, LinkedIn, Mr. David McQueen. Uh, you can also go to your website, davidmcqueen.co.uk. I'm a little disappointed that it doesn't have the Mr. before that, but you know what? We're welcome. We're welcome. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and then the last one, which is the Twitter handle of Mr. David McQueen underscore. David, it was wonderful having you on, as always. I can't wait to have you on again. Definitely. Thank, Thank you. Much, man. All right.